Welcome. I have a little bit of a sore throat, so I'm, if I'm a little sotto voce today, you'll understand why. Uh, let me introduce the people who are at the table today. To my immediate uh, right is uh, my superb counsel, Alfonso David. To his right, uh, Kristen Prouda Browdy. Uh, to my left, Reverend Sloan. And to his left, Beverly Tillery. And I thank them all very much for being here. I thank the families, the advocates who are here today. Uh, for this very important topic. Uh, before I begin uh, with the topic at hand, we had a very uh, disturbing incident uh, happen in New York City, uh, another anti, uh, act of anti-Semitism, where the uh, Children's Jewish Museum in Brooklyn, uh, someone wrote on the wall, Hitler's coming. Uh, now, this was at a center that was started in the memory of Ari Halberstam, who was killed on the Brooklyn Bridge as a hate crime. And his mother, Devorah Halberstam, uh, started this center for cultural understanding, etc. Uh, this museum, this center, had been attacked before. Uh, this is the third attack at the center, and it's part of a very troubling pattern that we're seeing. Increased anti-Semitic attacks all across this country and all across this state. You know, you like to think that, well, New York is different when you hear about this hateful conduct this discriminatory conduct. We say, well, this is New York. We're, we're more sophisticated. We have a better understanding. We're more compassionate. We're more enlightened. Anti-Semitism is increasing all across the state. The attacks are increasing all across the state, from one end to the other. And it is part of this uh, cancer that has been injected into this nation's body that is about hate and about separation and about fearing differences uh, and is growing. Uh, it can't grow here in the state of New York. Uh, and it is repugnant to who we are. It's repugnant to what we believe. It's personally offensive to me. I am born and bred New Yorker. I grew up with the Jewish community. The Jewish community is such a part of this city and state. Two of my brothers-in-law are Jewish, I have nieces. Uh, so it is personally offensive to me, and I'm sure it's personally offensive to every New Yorker. And uh, two things. One, it's illegal, and these are hate crimes. And we will prosecute the person to the fullest extent of the law, I promise you. Uh, and second, uh, it's not who we are as a people. It's not what we believe. And we should all speak with one voice in condemning this. Discrimination against any one person or one class is discrimination against everyone. You can't pick and choose. Uh, and that's the lesson that we've learned here in New York as the capital of diversity. And while this uh, poison is spreading nationwide, let's stand tall in New York and let's stand as one against it. Uh, today's uh, agenda is very much along the same lines. Uh, we have 11 days left in the legislative session. 11 days. Uh, is like two minutes left in a ball game. It goes very quickly. Uh, and there are a number of items that uh, need to be attended to that have not been attended to. This legislative st session started back in January and uh, started with a lot of energy. We had a new Democratic Senate for the first time, uh, first time since I've been governor. So many of the items that had been bottled up and stopped for years could finally pass, and uh, many of them did pass. We passed the Reproductive Health Act, we passed gender, we passed new gun laws. Uh, we did a lot of good work, DREAM Act, uh, but there's more work to do. 
And uh, at this point, uh, I outlined 10 additional items that need to be done uh, for us to really have a successful progressive session where we can look back and say, uh, this is great, New York set the standard once again, which is our responsibility, right? Uh, New York carries a, a heavier burden. New York is the state that sets the progressive mark. I believe that. And we've done that in the past, and it's our ongoing role. So there's more work to do. Two of the items uh, I want to speak to today, uh, because they are two of the uh, most, uh, most repulsive issues that we have to correct. Uh, the first issue is on what they call the uh, gay and trans panic defense. Uh, I don't believe New Yorkers even understand this or know that it's the current law in the state of New York. And I believe if they did know it, uh, they would be horrified. Under our current law, uh, we have as a valid defense uh, that someone can raise in a criminal case that when they found out the person was gay or trans, they were so disturbed emotionally that they were not fully responsible for their actions. All right, so think about this for a second. A uh, person is being tried for murder or assault they have a valid defense where they can claim, I was uh, extremely emotionally disturbed because I had just found out the person was gay. That codifies homophobia. That's what that is. It is the legal codification of homophobia. It's saying, I found out the person was gay, I was so disturbed, I was not in my right mind. And that should be a defense to a criminal case. No. No. And if you found out the person was Italian-American, would that justify being emotionally disturbed to the point where you're mental state was altered, if you found out the person was African American, could you claim I was so disturbed? It is the institutionalization and it is the codification of discrimination, stereotyping, and homophobia. It is disgusting that it is still on the books. The American Bar Association, American Bar Association, not just New York, where you have all those progressives and liberals, American Bar Association, says uh, it should no longer exist. It exists here in the state of New York. It has to be taken off the books. It's exactly opposite every message that we've been sending, every law that we passed. The second existing law that has to be repealed is a prohibition on surrogacy. Right now, a gay couple, infertile couple, wants to have a child. Uh, in 47 states, you can contract with a woman for gestational birth, where a surrogate will carry the fetus for a couple. 47 states. New York State prohibits it. Uh, it is illegal in the state of New York to contract with a surrogate. This means if you're an infertile couple and you want to have a child and the methodology is through surrogacy, you can't do it in New York State. You have to travel to one of the other 47 states, uh, make arrangements in another state, deal with another state's laws, uh, and then come back to the state of New York. If you're a gay couple and you want to have a child, you have to leave the state of New York to do it. How ironic that the state that first 
passed marriage equality saying equality, not just marriage, it was about equality, that the love of an LGBTQ couple is equal to the love of a heterosexual couple, straight couple. And we pass marriage equality. And we now say, God bless you, you're married. And you say, well, I now want to create a family. Part of getting married, for many people, is then starting a family. Oh, no, you can't do that in the state of New York. No surrogacy is, is permitted. There is no rational opposition to it. The opposition that has been suggested, well, it's exploitive of the woman who would be the surrogate. Our law says protect the woman's rights, make sure she has legal counsel, Make sure she has health insurance. Make sure she has the right to terminate uh, the pregnancy if she so desires. Make sure all her rights are protected. She's informed. It's intelligent consent. She knows her rights. It's also totally opposite the argument we just made in the Reproductive Health Act where it's a woman's body, it's a woman's choice, right? That was our argument. And if a woman wants to serve as a surrogate and wants to give a couple a baby, which is a beautiful gift and bring a life into the world, and her rights are represented, why wouldn't you let her do it? Why wouldn't you let her do it? with the attorney, with the counselor, with all the provisions, more than any other state in the United States of America, our surrogacy, surrogacy program would have the most protections for the woman in the nation. Why wouldn't you want to do it? Both of these laws are discriminatory, stereotyping, and anti-LGBTQ. That's what they are. I wouldn't be surprised if President Trump proposed these laws. <clears throat> but I'm shocked that the New York State Legislature would ever leave Albany without correcting these two obnoxious violations that are repugnant to what we believe and who we are and an injustice to the LGBTQ community. With that, let me turn it over to Reverend Sloan, who will make some remarks. Uh, then we'll hear from Kristen, and then we'll hear from Beverly, and then uh, we'll take some questions. So thank Reverend. you, Governor. Um, it's a great honor to be here today to provide a voice to hundreds of New Yorkers who have been unable to achieve their dreams of forming a family in this state because of New York's antiquated gestational surrogacy law. It's critical that New York address the issue of gestational surrogacy. It's an issue that's increasingly important to the LGBTQ community and to so many others. And with your support today, Governor, we can do just that. Gestational surrogacy provides both same-sex couples and those struggling with fertility the chance to conceive a child and yet gestational surrogacy is illegal in New York, and most New Yorkers do not know it. We recently did a poll that showed that 72% of New Yorkers, when made aware of this, uh, approve of surrogacy and want this law changed. In the most progressive, forward-thinking, and inclusive state in the nation, it's both shocking and heartbreaking for those who are interested in gestational surrogacy to learn that this practice is, burnt, is banned in their home state. Oftentimes for these individuals and couples, gestational surrogacy is not only their best, but their only option for forming their family. And so they're faced with the life-shaming decision to face the debilitating emotional and financial burden of seeking a surrogate out of this state or a prolonging or even abandoning their hopes of forming a family. 
With us today, we have a family that has been affected by New York surrogacy law. I want to acknowledge one family in particular, and that is, uh, well, actually, it's Olivia Van Degna. Olave, do you want to wave, Olivia? <laughs> Yay, Olivia! <laughs> so she hailed a ca cab today, and she brought her parents, Andrew and Xavier, and she brought her grandfather, uh, Bob. In 2013, because of the restrictive nature of surrogacy laws, uh, the Van Dagnas were forced to choose a surrogate on the other side of the country in California. Um, as happens with births, um, it happened uh, without them uh, expecting it. And they were in a plane on the way for, uh, above Kansas when they got the picture of Olivia's birth and saw her for the first time. Nobody should have to do that. Unfortunately, their struggle with surrogacy is far too common in the New York State. It's a burden that no one should have to bear, yet each and every day of inaction by our legislature is yet another day that countless New Yorkers are saddled with the consequences of this outrageous ban. It's disgraceful that our current law discriminates against both LGBTQ people and people who are infertile and need help conceiving. And it takes an emotional toll. And we will not stand for it any longer. On behalf of Family Equality Council, the Protecting Mother Families Coalition, and of all New Yorkers who want nothing more than to form a family, I implore our legislature to stand up in these last 11 days and to do what is right and to end the ban on surrogacy once and for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kristen Browdy. Thank you, Governor. Your advocacy on behalf of our community has been continuous and wonderful, and we will never forget it. Thank you so much. When you didn't have a unified legislature, you delivered on marriage equality. And when that non-unified legislature balked at expanding LGBTQ protections, you came out with executive orders that went a long way to making New York not just safer for us, but a beacon to the nation and the world. Now this year, in the first months with a solid legislature, you signed into law gender and the ban on conversion torture, not therapy. <laughs> now you're committing to work to end the ban on surrogacy and once again showing us that you really are a leader for equality. And I personally and everyone here has to appreciate that. But as the end of this session draws near, and even as you're working to continue that unprecedented progress that we've had, progress that frankly most of us thought would never happen in our lifetimes, there's a lot that has to be done. The so-called gay and trans panic defense allows perpetrators of domestic and other violence against people like me and LGBTQ people across this state to claim, oh my gosh, I lost my mind. I found out she's trans. Well, it's not a secret, but OK. Um, it's not just a theoretical defense. In Harlem, just a couple of years ago, there was a murder of a trans woman walking down the street, broad daylight, a man catcalled her, and his friend said, hey, you're hitting on someone who's transgender. The guy became so enraged that he killed her. And at trial, he used the defense and used it successfully. That's an outrage. It's an absolute outrage. This defense is an affront to LGBTQ people everywhere. It has no place in New York State. It's not just theoretical, it's real. Would it be OK if I said I lost my mind because I found out you're Jewish or Catholic or Irish? It's an absurdity. And the legislature, which includes many of our friends, people that we worked hard to put there, should not leave Albany without making sure that this defense is ended in New York State. The governor's message to the legislature is clear, and it is a message that as the president of the LGBT Bar Association of Greater New York and co-chair of the National Trans Bar Association, I can't emphasize strongly enough. These people should not leave Albany. And they're my friends, and they're your friends, and they're people we know and appreciate. 
but their job's not done, and they shouldn't go home until they finish the work. And finishing the work means finishing the gay and trans panic defense once and for all in New York. Thank you, Governor. Here, here. Well said. Thank you very much, Kristen. Well said. Beverly Tillery, thank you for being here. Thank you, Governor Cuomo, um, for gathering us here together, for, for your leadership. Um, you have helped New York um, be at the forefront of the fight for ensuring legal protections for LGBTQ people across the state. Um, and while we've made tremendous progress, New York is shockingly behind the curve when it comes to our surrogacy laws, as you've heard, as well as allowing the use of gay and trans panic legal defense. The Anti-Violence Project is the largest LGBTQ anti-violence organization in the nation and we convene and coordinate the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs. Together, we've been tracking violence against our communities for almost 40 years and reporting data on that violence for over 20 years. Across the nation, we continue to see high rates of violence, hate violence, against lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and gender nonconforming people, and particularly, trans women of color, and black trans women. Nationally, homicides of trans women of color reached an all-time high in 2017, with 22 losing their lives to hate violence. Just last week, our community and the country mourned the death of three black trans women, Malaysia Booker, Michelle Simone, and Claire Legato. In our most recent hate violence report, we also found that the severity of hate violence across the country for LGBTQ people is increasing. We found that 46% of folks who reported hate violence had sustained some kind of injury. 45% had to seek medical attention. And 23% reported that weapons were used in the incidents of violence. The Trump administration, their rhetoric and their policies not only are seeking to strip away the rights of trans and gender nonconforming people, but to put them at even greater danger, making it clear that their lives are not valued. We're gonna fight against that. LGBTQ New Yorkers are not immune to this violence. Sometimes we think we're in a bubble but approximately 3,000 people contact our hotline every year reporting incidents of violence. Survivors are seeking support, they wanna report their incidents, and they need help. In 2017, there were seven hate violence homicides of LGBTQ people in New York State. That made us tied with Texas as the state that had the highest number of hate violence homicides that year. In 2013, as Kristen said, we lost Ilan Nettles, a 21-year-old black trans woman to hate violence in Harlem. The man who killed her told detectives that he started flirting with her, unaware she was transgender, and then became enraged and attacked her when his friends began mocking him for trying to pick up a trans woman. Elan's mother, Dolores Nettles, is here with us today. Come on away, Dolores. <laughs> thank you for being here. And thank you for being a tireless advocate, a fierce fighter um, for justice for Elan and for all trans women. Just last year, in Brooklyn, New York, Clifford Williams was killed in his own home when a man who accompanied him back to his apartment became enraged because Clifford flirted with him. When individuals claim this gay or trans panic defense, they're essentially saying they're trying to justify their violence by blaming the victim simply because of who they are. We cannot tolerate these homophobic and transphobic, 
defenses to be used in our courts any longer. In order for our state to continue to be a national leader in advancing justice for all, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, we must ban the use of gay and trans panic legal defense. And while AVP realizes that over-reliance on the criminal legal system has not always served the LGBTQ survivors seeking justice and disproportionately harms communities of color, this is a critical step that we have to take right now. Dolores Nettles is counting on us. So are the families of other LGBTQ victims of violence and the thousands of survivors of hate violence across this state. In this session, as we celebrate 50 years of Stonewall, um, since Stonewall, the legislature has to join the governor in sending a clear message to the rest of the nation by passing these critical measures that will be positively impacting millions of New Yorkers from now and years to come. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Very, very powerfully said. Thank you very much, Beverly, Reverend, Kristen. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the press on this topic? Uh, I'll take off topics uh, after. Governor, you probably heard the assembly conference surrogacy this week, and it didn't go very well. Apparently, a lot of groups are opposed. The Senate says there is widespread support. Would you anticipate having a problem in the assembly? Uh, look, I know there is opposition. Uh, the Catholic Church is opposed, um, and I understand that uh, opposition in the legislature, uh, legislators, no one wants to take a difficult vote. I understand that. I understand the Catholic Church can be a fierce opponent. I've lived with it all my life. Uh, the Catholic Church was opposed to Reproductive Health Act. It was opposed to marriage equality. It's opposed to a protecting a woman's right to choose. My father, in his professional career, had to deal with it. Um, but, you know, you are elected to represent all the people of the state, or you're elected to represent a Senate district or an assembly district. And sometimes uh, you can't make everyone happy. I understand that. I understand the Catholic Church doesn't support this. Uh, but it is clearly the right thing to do, in my opinion. Uh, and it's, it's time for the legislature to stand up and, yes, deal with the opposition. I get it. I get it. I understand politics. Uh, and I understand that it's not an easy vote. And I understand that the easier votes were taken earlier in session. Um, but the first month of the legislative session does not mean we've done everything that we needed to do. And we now celebrated that we have a progressive legislature with the Senate and with the Assembly, finally. This is what we elected them to do. If you're not going to stand up for the LGBTQ community, then why did we need you? Right? Yeah. So just to add to what the governor said, um, currently 8% of uh, gay men uh, have children in the United States. Um, uh, we just did the first national poll on the future of family formation for LGBTQ people. 63% of our millennials are planning on having children. If New York is going to be prepared to serve the future of the LGBTQ community, this is a law that needs to change, and it's up to the assembly to go ahead and to stand up at this time. Also, Zach, as they do their political calculation, on the scale of political calculation, uh, well, this group is opposed, this group is opposed. What today says is, uh, if you expect to come back from Albany and call yourself a progressive Democrat, and you did not pass uh, these two laws don't show up before the LGBTQ community and expect to be praised for what you've done because you have not fulfilled your obligation 
for progressive representation of the LGBTQ community, period, period. I have a two-part question on, on the surrogacy. Um, I'm curious, personally for you, when did you focus on this issue? I seem to remember you being asked about it in the years past. Did you not push for it in the past because you just didn't think with um, Republicans in the Senate it would be able to pass, or was this something you had to weigh on your own? And the second part of my question is about the economic benefits to New York State of surrogacy, because I from you know, friends, people I know who have been through this process, there are intermediaries, attorneys, agencies that specialize in this, and all that business is going out of New York State. Have you looked at the economic benefit, potentially, to allowing surrogacy to happen here in New York? Yeah, yeah, it's a, two good questions, Melissa. First, on the first part, uh, you know, so much of my governorship, I had a Republican Senate, and I understood their politics, uh, and uh, many of them were extreme conservatives, social conservatives. Uh, despite that, frankly, we passed more progressive laws than I think anyone had a right to expect. We passed marriage equality with a uh, Republican Senate after it had just lost, and lost with Democrats, by the way. So, uh, but there was a lot of frustration that we could not get done a lot of the socially progressive issues. Uh, surrogacy was not even feasible. Uh, the Reproductive Health Act was not feasible. The DREAM Act was not feasible. Uh, but today is a different reality. We all worked very hard to elect a Democratic Senate so we could get these progressive things done. And that's the energy that you feel in this room. Okay, now there are no excuses, right? And these are obvious. These are, I understand this political opposition. There's political opposition to everything. But these are repugnant concepts to allow to exist. 47 states, but not New York, after you passed marriage equality, but now you say you can't start a family. Gay panic defense. I mean, it's just repugnant on its face. And you're right, there are economic benefits. Uh, we have been saying to people for many years, come to New York State, 50 years of Stonewall, you're welcome here. We don't discriminate, we don't judge, we welcome all. And that's part of what's made New York the diverse population and the successful place it is. And no doubt that there's an economic loss to telling people, well, now you have to go out of state and uh, possibly relocate out of state. I've spoken to people who said, I moved so I could have a child. You need resources to be able to fly back and forth to California uh, to accomplish surrogacy. So there's no doubt that there'd be economic benefits if people stayed in New York. And lawyers and yes, yes, all across the board. When you're going off that question, surrogacy could cost upwards of $100,000 and that's inaccessible to a lot of families. So you're pushing for surrogacy to be legalized in New York, but what about the health plans that are not covering it? Are you pushing for them to mandate it as well? We've been talking to the health plans about it. Uh, right now it's a short conversation because it's not legal in New York, but once it becomes legal, that will be the next, next step, yes. Uh, I, I would support extended coverage or understanding their grounds on how they could disqualify coverage. And, and Governor, if I supplement that, in the, the law that we're negotiating, uh, we would require the Department of Financial Services and the Department of Health to issue regulations to make sure that there's appropriate coverage. Governor, in the last couple of days, you've been very public about uh, these two provisions and, and some other things on your, your final you know, top ten list for priors. Uh, very public, very firm. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to what what other efforts you're making kind of behind the scenes, because while it's clearly the legislative leader's job to round up votes, uh, there's also room for the executive to, to call and, and work with uh, individual lawmakers, little carrot, little stick. Can you talk about the, the other part, the non-bully public, non-bully public, non-public part? That yeah, the legislative session, for those of you who don't study Albany, which God bless you for not studying Albany, uh, the legislative session starts in January, goes to June, 
and it's basically a mirror of what happens in Washington. There are two basic segments to the session. January to April, April 1, we have to do the budget. And most of the major legislative activity takes place around the budget because most of it has an economic consequence. Uh, it is also a point in time where the legislature must act because they have to do a budget by April 1. They have to stop talking, stop debating, stop lobbying, and vote. So that's a point in time where there's an opportunity to get a lot of things done. And I maximize to the best I can that budget passage to get many pieces of legislation passed. To me, uh, I get the rhetoric of politics, I get the press releases of politics, but if you don't get something done at the end of the day, it's all pointless. And I think part of the uh, disgust with politics nowadays is it just hasn't made enough progress for people. So I'm about getting things done. So April 1 is the first demarcation. The next demarcation is when they leave town, which is going to be June 19th. And there'll be a closing uh, package of bills, if you will. So after Memorial Day, you start to focus on the last uh, couple of weeks, which will be an opportunity to do some more of the legislation. And I've outlined 10 pieces of legislation, which I think are priorities to get done uh, before they leave on the 19th. And I do all of the above. The issues we're talking about today, the best way to get a legislator to change their mind is to inform people of the facts, and then the people inform the legislator. It's not fancy, but it is still the formula that works. Uh, in our system, the negative voices are always heard. When Zach said, well, they had a conference, meaning they had a meeting on surrogacy, it didn't go well. Why didn't it go well? Because all the negatives have communicated with the legislators. The positive voices tend to be uh, quieter and need to be mobilized and that's what we're doing today so part of it is the public mobilization process uh, part of it is I talk it through with individual legislators which I have I talk it through with the legislative leaders I talk it through with groups uh, we have the Democratic Party that is working on behalf of these issues and generating support among the Democratic Party so uh, you know, I, I use every means possible to communicate with the legislators um, and then pick the priorities because you can't get everything done. And I picked 10 priorities. But uh, these two issues, to me, are two of the most socially repulsive, embarrassing, dehumanizing discriminatory issues that this legislature should address. Governor, the Catholic Church is opposed to this. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you reconcile your belief that this should be legal here in the state with the church's opposition, sort of from a personal perspective, because that seems to be driving a lot of the opposition to legislation? Yeah, but uh, look, the Catholic Church has their religious beliefs. I happen to be a Catholic. My father was a Catholic. Uh, and I have my Catholic beliefs and my Catholicism and my religion, and then I have my constitutional obligation as governor of the state of New York, and they are two uh, different roles. I don't govern as a Catholic. Uh, I govern for all New Yorkers, and uh, I believe marriage equality and Reproductive Health Act and the laws we're talking about today are inherently discriminatory and violative of the law. When I did marriage equality, which was also opposed by the Catholic Church, I said it is discriminatory and it violates the law not to allow LGBTQ people to marry. Why can straight people marry, but gay people can't marry? It is illegal. And by the way, 
three years later, the Supreme Court said it was illegal. I believe these two laws, if challenged constitutionally, are illegal. On a personal level, how do you come to this sort of this belief that you know gays personally should have the right to marry, and gays personally should have the right to have a surrogate? Like, how do you reconcile on a personal level? How do you reconcile your faith with with your policy position? Well, I can reconcile my faith. I it's my my belief in what Jesus Christ. Uh, taught us and what his teachings were all about as I interpret them. Uh, but I understand the church as an organization opposes it. May I offer you some support on that? Please. I'm a divorce lawyer by trade. New York was the last state in the nation to have no-fault divorce because the Catholic Church opposed it. We shouldn't be the last state in the Union. Forty-seven other states allow surrogacy. We sh our people are, are having surrogate children. They have to. That's how they have families. We shouldn't force them to go elsewhere, as we used to force them, to go to Nevada to get a divorce. It's just wrong. It makes no sense. The Catholic Church's position may be what some believe, but the fact is that the Catholic Church has opposed every, every single piece of legislation. They opposed gender. They opposed every piece of legislation of importance to progressives and to LGBTQ New Yorkers. They oppose this one. I'm sorry. This isn't about religion. This is about equal protection under the law. And the governor is right on the money here that protecting New Yorkers is what counts, not somebody's personal religious beliefs. Unfortunately, um, it's difficult to track those cases, but we do have examples of where the gay or trans panic defense has been used, unfortunately, in the case that was referenced by Beverly and several others. And it's not only, unfortunately, here in New York. We're seeing it used in other parts of the country as well. So we can get you some examples. But Zach, uh, Kristen mentioned this. I mentioned this. Just, <clears throat> just substitute any other class for that situation, and look how absurd it sounds. My defense is, when I found out he was Italian-American and of Italian descent, I was extremely emotionally disturbed, and that's a justification. Because they were Irish, because they were Jewish, because he was tall, because he, I mean, if, it, if you put it in any other frame, it is so ludicrous a concept. Uh, that it's not even conceivable. And all of this is together, by the way. We started talking about the uh, anti-Semitism in Brooklyn. Hate begets hate. Discrimination begets discrimination. Stereotype begets more stereotyping. Once you allow hate to exist anywhere, it grows stronger. We're talking about ending discrimination against LGBTQ people. That's what this is really about. The way we started talking about ending discrimination against Jewish people. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. And the answer is for everyone to stand for everyone else. That is the answer. For the LGBTQ community to stand with the Jewish community, the Jewish community stand with the LGBTQ community, stand with the straight community, that is the answer. And where you find that injustice, stamp it out. Well, there's opposition. Too bad. You were elected to govern. Stand up and govern. You were not elected to take the easy votes, but the hard votes, uh, those you don't want to take. That is not why you were elected to be the progressive legislature of New York. Progressive is not a button that you wear during a campaign. Progressive is an ideology and an action agenda where you say, I will stand up and I will vote for the progressive measures even if it's hard, and especially when it's hard. And that's what it means to be a progressive. And that's what they have to remember. Catholic Church. 
which I thought we mentioned. <laughs> there's, some, there's some criminal... Oh, I don't know. You'd have to ask them member by member. They're, they're, they haven't put it up for a vote, so it's all anonymous, right? Uh, which is another legislative phenomenon. Who stopped it? Nobody knows, because they won't put it up for a vote. Uh, we're gonna, going to demand accountability if this doesn't happen. See, it's not enough, Zach, to say they had a closed-door conference and they said they're not going to do it. Who's they? Because if they don't do it, my point is, you're all to blame. You're all to blame. Do you yes. think that the, is that playing as much of a role in the assemblies, whoever's blocking it, we don't know who they are? I, I don't know, Melissa, but look, our law, women can be victimized. Okay, make sure they're not. Lawyers, counselors, Department of Health oversees it. Uh, health insurance, she has a right to terminate the pregnancy. So it's a fully informed consent. But then we just passed the Reproductive Health Act. If a woman has a fully informed consent with a lawyer, there's no danger of exploitation, how can you tell her not to do it? Right? Right. So, so Governor, where, when the, the gay trans panic, is, where, where, did it, where did that come from? And where, where, where did it start? Is it, is it a law? Is it legislation? It is a, it is, when did it start? Do you know? Well, it's been used in several cases, and it's in the criminal procedure law where someone can argue that there is an emotional disturbance, a severe emotional disturbance. It has been interpreted to be used in these cases. So it's just a precedent? Is that it? Yes. yes. So by legislation, you can undo a precedent? Is Correct. So you would essentially say in this piece of the criminal procedure law, it does not, you cannot interpret emotional disturbance to include finding out that someone is LGBTQ. So the you would create an is, exception. The defense is I was emotionally disturbed and therefore not in my right mind and not fully responsible for what I did. And that has been interpreted as uh, covering the circumstance. I found out the person was gay. I found out the person was trans. And that triggered an emotional distress. And that is now a valid defense. This law would say that is not a valid basis to justify being emotionally disturbed. Yes. Okay, let's take a picture and then we'll take off topic questions. <laughs>